I'm going to make my case, Jeff, for you um, to add to your n next and last phase. And, and I can't stress this enough. Um, and that would be, as I mentioned in that short clip earlier, House, no, not House of Long Shadows. Well, that is brilliant. It probably is kind of worth it, maybe 15 quid. Because the documentary is quite lengthy. Uh, it's one I have mentioned before, so I mentioned it quite recently in a reply to you in this very imagined year. Although this will be coupled together as a uh, film. And that is the box set Who Done It? Now I know it's available on network. Uh, it was seventeen ninety nine the last time I looked, but that was a long time ago. And give or take a you know pounds here and there, it'll, it'll, you know it fluctuates on on Amazon. But I want to stress how what a good good program it is. I mean, to be honest with you, I haven't watched the first series with Edward Woodward at the helm. I watched um, part of an episode. And it looks like... Uh, well, I'll come into that later on anyway. So, to make it... Uh, to break it down, you know that just a bit, the episodes are widely available on YouTube. And I've got, uh, the synopsis of it is, which you're probably fully aware of, uh, it's uh, a celebrity panel show, quiz show element to it, uh, which I think has been reproduced not so long ago on BBC um, maybe with members of the public not celebrities but uh, you know they're given a case so I refer to for this particular section about who done it which is kind of a re reveal um, yeah so Starts off with uh, an introduction by the host, whether it be series one, Edward Woodward, or series two to six, John Pertwee. And he introduces, um, he describes what's going to happen, and then introduces the, the guest panellists. It, the format does change um, over the, the next few seasons. There's four guest panellists. I think the ones with the most appearances is probably um, Patrick Mower, who got the nickname as the Bulldog. And probably... This blonde lady who probably went into interior design and designed some hotels. Nice looking piece and all called Anushka Hempel. And, um, and it's Rich Joel Sullivan makes a few appearances, maybe not as many as Patrick, the, the, the two I just mentioned. Terry Scott appears in one. Um, Lindsay Wagner, who I think was in. It's not Wonder Woman. I'm sure she was in some kind of superhero program, it's, but it's not. It's not Wonder Woman. Made Bionic Woman, I think. Yeah, that's it. I think she was in Bionic Woman. Um, she has one appearance, as does George Savalis. You know, um, Teddy Savalis's brother, and obviously he died eighty-five of cancer. Seems to be a wonderful family. 
Um, and there's lots of people that I mean, Arthur Mullard makes one appearance. Um, Rodney Beals, he makes about two or three, maybe four appearances in it from the like the lads. And Magnus Pike is in two or three episodes. And Sheila Hancock makes, makes a couple of appearances too. Yeah. And one actress, Sandra Dickinson, I think it was the ex wife of Peter Davison, the Doctor Who. And as an English actress with a similar squeaky voice, it was named Escapes at the moment, but she's nice looking, but a voice <laughs> very high pitched, very squeaky, as was Sandra Dickinson. Well, probably is, but it's all right. So that's the premise. It comes on just uh, in the first, at least the first series, first two series, there's um, all four people from both of arts, music, theatre, whatever. And of the subsequent series, after that, they would have, I think, series four. At least series four, maybe three and four, they would have four members of the audience who would um, have to follow it as well as the celebrity guest panellists, which were also four. And they all had to write down clues are spotted, who they suspect did it. A bit like filling out a card for the Cluedo game. And then he collects them up. Um, the format subsequently changed proper season 5 and 6 or 5 at least I can't remember if that's series 6 where they would have a competition in the Radio Times and that winner would be on a guest panellist so it went down from 4 celebrity guest panellists down to three plus the Radio Times winner. So the dispense with the four members of the public sat at the front of the audience queue. So and I think the last series made it away with it all together. The winner as regarding members of the public um, would win a prize. Now the first three series, uh, it was um, in like an A4 picture frame. There was a magnifying glass with the hood on its symbol, obviously in the paper with like a cutout of the of the fab. So the win a magnifying glass is someone won it. The panelists would win a fifty pound donation to a charity of their choice if, if nobody won it that that week it was rolled over now uh because i'm not quite sure what i'm on the moment so i'll get inside the season four or five the prize element was upped a little bit they were i think they were given a uh, magnifying glass and one item from the props used in the reenactment from oh you know from from the crime episode so it could be uh, a clock could be anything anything used one item used during the reenactment part plus, i think plus the the magnifying glass i want to i might put um a spoiler out, uh, a spoiler, a tweet out to see if any of these magnifying glasses from Who Done It are still available or were they just chucked up because they'll be it's memorabilia now. Surely somewhere there has to be one of these framed magnifying glasses from the Who Done It TV show. Be nice, especially if any of the props 
that they were allowed to keep her are still knocking about. So that, that's been, you know, covered from four members of the panellists just doing the crimes and then do four members of the panellists plus four members of the public who were sat at the vantage point in the audience to um, go from four guest panellists down to three and one of them being a Radio Times winner to them, I think, doing, probably the last series doing away with that altogether and having four panellists again. Um, to the prizes being um, the magnifying glass in the picture frame with the Who Done It logo, to that plus selecting an item from the props used in a reenactment. Um, I, like I said, I haven't really watched uh, the first series, which Edward Woodward was the chair host. I watched a bit but I've generally gone straight on to um, John with the late Doctor Who and Wurzel Gummidge John Pertwee at the helm from 2 to 6 and I found it a thoroughly enjoyable show but in parts I mean this first this will be the part 3 which I'll send to you messenger this will form part one of the video, and then, which I put onto YouTube. Parts uh, four, five, six will be, if it goes to that, will be part two. So you're, you're getting it in segments, but when I put it onto YouTube and Facebook and that, there'll be, three parts will be in one. If you catch my drift. So I'll send this. Send it off being stitched together, and then I'll commence with um, a more in depth analysis of who done it and why you should have it on your hit list. It's a recommendation from me. So that's the hosts covered, that's the kind of prizes they got covered, and that's the different formats that they um, tried and tested with. Having guest panelists from the audience and guest panelists from the celebrity world, um, you'll enjoy Nushka Hempel. Mm -mm -mm. Maybe not now, but back then. Um, uh, now they change it around, and the guest panelists had. £25 or £50 was went to a chat of their cars if it wasn't the little road over. So, the basis of um, enjoying Who Done It, like I said, I've yet to tread into Series 1. This is where people would normally start. You know, where do you start? Well, at the beginning. Well, because the clips I've seen on YouTube, for the, you know, as you called it, I should call it Jeff Horn's YouTube test. I uh, saw so John Pertwee, and I really enjoy it. John Pertwee is, in my mind, the most excellent host of Food on It, as he did the majority of the episodes. Um, but he's really good humoured. Um, there's one particular thing that you'll find funny. It's a, uh, it's one which actually, it's the one which has Terry Scott as one of the celebrity guest panelists trying to solve the crime, and it involves this, um, I think, Nairin Dean Dawn Porter's in it, I think, and it's set in a like a beauty salon, hairdressers, spa treatment, and all that, and. Somebody's murdered while she's got a face mask on and that, and she's found dead. Um, and the clue is, I think maybe a towel, I think like that. And when the sh show, the show, the the do, the show, the uh, uh, how the person was murdered or killed, and then, oh right. 
and the police turn up then do 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 and then it cuts to the studio in which John Pertwee says right we're now at Mardi Gras beauty parlour uh, one of the thingy a lady a lady pig nose of it has been murdered and now the police have been involved and uh, we'll show yeah, our guest panelists tonight are Sheila Hancock Tony Tony T Terry Scott blah 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 and blah blah so we now go back to the scene where uh, Sergeant Big Cock and Inspector John Holmes are quizzing the staff so then it cuts back to the beauty salon where all members all members of staff and the whoever's patronising the place are asked of their movements and what they can remember you see and carries on into after the first commercial break it carries on and it comes to the point where and it, and it this particular one it says, oh yeah, she's, oh, so, oh yeah, she, she was, in, she was drunk, absolutely drunk. Uh, she, you know, was uh, pushing people away and blah, blah, blah. She tumbled through the door. Um, one of them, actually, there was one of the stylists in the reenactment. There was, whether it was or not, but he really puts on a, um, I mean, camp, don't come into it. The way he's, way he's, He's basically, if he, even this bloke who playing this stylist still works at this salon, this reenactment, even if he wasn't gay in real life, he portrayed him as really the campest of camp gay hairstylist. You, I mean, a stereotypical vision of what a camp hairstylist would sound like. Some of them do, some of them don't. But, if, I mean, camp, I mean... <laughs> It portrays it the very definition of camp. And um, it says, oh yeah, well, you know, the idea she was pissed, at, pissed, pissed old drunk anyway. And then obviously that bit's bleeped out and the, the, oh, the whole audience oh, are laughing. Terry Scott, that's it, that's the end of the show. Because obviously pissed was, then was a, you know, an old go zone. It was technically a, like a swear word. Um... But it got a good chuckle out of the crowd and the celebrity panellists, including, <laughs> including the great late Terry Scott. I mean, there's some, I mean, there's some like, I mean, these days, some of the stuff to say um, is definitely not, it's only a few occasions. It's like a minor, I mean, it's probably maybe 5% of the room where some of the stuff that's uttered on the show is definitely not PC. I'll give you one example. Um, one of the actors who plays rather an old eccentric effeminate character. Um, I think he was in Karen Don't Lose Your Head. Um, he was in the film version of Man About the House as uh, the one who has Melvin Hayes as his boyfriend, the one who likes bikes. If you remember the film version of Man About the House, and you remember the one who was um, Melvin Hayes as his boyfriend, who was mad on motorbikes. Him. You recognise me in a lot of films, carry on films and and stuff. And but this is one where it features Christopher Beanie. Um. Stephen Yardley, who was in Howard's Way, and his real life wife, uh, Janet. I can't remember them, but she was also eventually in Howard's Way with Stephen Yardley. And they're basically these these jurors that have been called back to this reunion by this mysterious message, and basically the bloke that they convicted. He's saying, I was, I was innocent and I've given you all the poison in your food and I'm the only one that can help you. I have the antidote. 
and basically one by one they all well one, one of them dies and we're all made seriously ill then that's it the um then they're back in the studio then one by one as a film it they all oh poison oh, gone and but the, the the oldest man who plays the effeminate character in that film version of Man About the House who has Melvin Hayes as his boyfriend uh, and he's from the current films um, he most likely was gay you know he, he always played with it be like Quentin a bit, um, you know but like an eccentric version he says well this is this is cheeky this is last this now this is I'm quoting from the show I'm not I'm quoting for historical accuracy what he said was yes and I was to think that I was in ten little niggers in at the Alhambra or somewhere in the West End now out of curiosity I researched this and apparently it was retitled Ten Little Indians. It was a book by Agatha Christie, I think. Originally, it was called Ten Little Niggers. Um, it was there was also a song about it, which was used. A song called Sep Winner. It, it was a musical. Wrote songs for musical, and um, he wrote under different aliases. But his name, was, I think, was Sep Winner. And he wrote a song, which was then for the Black White Minstrel Show, which is now <laughs> definitely not PC. You know, definitely the, the Black White Minstrel Show would not be on TV today. Um, because obviously BLM and it, you know, it's like harking back to the taking piss out when they were, when they were slaves, etc. So obviously that is old hat TV. That's yesterday's, which not really repeat all that much now, you know. So it was originally there was it was actually original cut, but was called Ten Little Niggers. But it was obviously as time move on, it was retitled Ten Little Indians. Now you can Google that. I'm I'm just quoting from an internet source, um, and I thought, oof. Jesus, how oh, they get away with that? But but I, th it, I don't think it wasn't meant um, at all in any racist way. It, you know, it wasn't like the word. You know, it, it, it was not a racist or derogatory term as it was used. It was referring to a play and a book by Christie, but uh, was a, was in time. Retitled, the N word was re re replaced by Indians, uh, but there was no racist overtone. To it. it was one little sentence referring to a play, which was probably called that when this character did it. But it, you know, I said it was now ten little Indians or ten little, mm, because people were. Think, oh, racist! No, I don't. There no, were no racist overtones at all. It was just a term which has now been changed and is is no longer used. You know what I mean? That's going to be part three. Yeah. So, like I said in this the YouTube version, as I said at the end of part two, there was no racist element at all uh, when the ten little was used. I know I've said that word before, but I'm not going to repeat it all the time. Uh, but you just check it out on, on Wikipedia. It was that, but it was changed to something more acceptable, maybe. Um, but it was. But the whole story is good, you know. And another bit which is quite a bit, quite a bit dicey is. We know in real life that um, Jack Smedhurst and all the cast of Love Thy Neighbour, which is a sitcom which probably wouldn't be on TV today, 
due to the BLM, BLM and how people, you know, the, the, the racist, racial situation, the terminology. It wouldn't be on the TV today. It is definitely a child of the 70s. But the only thing is, is that the cast of the show, you know, Rudolph Walker, Jack Smethurst and all that, in real life were good friends. They, they saw through how people might see it today. They, because he called him Snowflake, he called him Sambo and all this. And they took, they were took racial slurs against each other, but in reality, the one who always came up, uh, who came a cropper was always Jack Smethurst's character. He, he, like, look at the one with the voodoo. I mean, <laughs> When he thought that he actually put a voodoo curse on him uh, and he put it on that, he was, oh, I'm going, but there's one way he can solve it. How's that? Yeah. Bloody hell. Oh, not finished. What did you say to him, Bill? I just told him that, you know, he, yeah, blah, blah, blah. What did you say to him? I told him he had to go dance around the tree at midnight oh is that all no naked and then it cuts to him undressing in the bushes and then doing a like a tribal dance around the tree and i think bill pertwee is in it as a policeman who falls off his bicycle when he sees what's doing so yeah it's, it definitely wouldn't be on tv today but you know at the time um you know, people just need to take off their blinkers and, and see the whole picture. Yes, some of the words used, some of the phrases used is a very close to the edge. You know, um, definitely would be not PC today. But it, do it in real life, they were good friends. I mean, you saw in the, the movie version of Man About the House when... George Roper's desperate to get that document signed to for the compulsive purchase of their house. That he goes into the studio bar and there at the bar is Rudolph Walker and Jack Smethurst. And obviously it's stayed, but in real life I think they were good friends. They, they didn't see the negativity that would have come of it later on. Because you know, it's so-called controversial comedies. You got to see the bigger picture that it, it, they take the piss out of each other, and it's always Jack Smethurst's character that always comes off comes a cropper. But I think in real life they were good friends. So I went up kilter then. I was obviously referring to Love Thy Neighbour, which I might start watching from beginning again with the gusher because it, it's I haven't watched it in in uh, in running order, and it'd be great to get up to the. Um, up to the voodoo episode again when because you know in that show oh it's that jackal Alavarf and all that and his other mate him who plays the uh, paint the uh, plaster from the TV version of Blast His House and is also the man who was the cat and gets killed in the first story in From Beyond the Grave and he's in on the bus isn't he is Stan's mother's supposed boyfriend they all love um, the cats played by uh, Rudolph Walker it's only Jack Smethurst still has got who's got the issue but as you know in the first or second series when his gorgeous wife of Rudolph Walker in the show is sunbathing secretly he fancies her but his pride won't let him admit it that he's cool with it he has to keep up appearances that he's <laughs> He's the type of person that night that he, he would probably nosh off Nigel Farage. But in reality, he's totally cool with it, but he didn't want to lose face. And that's why he hasn't been a loser. Well, Jack Smedhurst and Nida Baden Semper, who plays the beautiful wife of Rudolph Walker, absolutely stunningly beautiful. Um, 
she and him were guest panelists on the show. And um, it's an episode which features uh, the man who plays the verger from Dad's Army and Frank Thornton from Are You Being Served and Last of Some Wine based at an airport, an airport arrival and smuggling. And um, one of the customs officers is a, a coloured actor. I don't know his name. But there's a couple of... Uh, again, I'm quoting roughly what was said. Um, wouldn't get away with these days, and I think Jack Smellis himself, he's, he was not he's not a racist, he was just a character. Yeah, people need to separate the person from the character. Um, Nida Baden Semper says something to one of the thingy, and then uh, he replies something like, uh, Oh, that's, that's all I bloody deemed in it. Black seat drivers. A play on words of backseat driver, like a person who's not driving, telling the driver what to do. Um, and then another one to the coloured actor. I don't know if that's the correct terminology, it probably isn't. Um, black actor, who plays one of the supporting roles in the reenactment at the, at the airport. Um, he says some kind of comment uh, about giving someone no one you give them the black look or something or that. Or, I can't remember I mean I'm like bloody hell how did they get away with it probably now if that I mean that's the controversial part of it in a way, but I don't think seriously. I mean, obviously, some people will say, "Oh, disgusting." But I don't think it was meant by any malice. It was. It was obviously trying to be in character of what he was known of at the time, which was "Love Thy Neighbor." Um, but that aside, right? Um, Who done it is an absolutely um, fantastic show. I mean, the, the the bits that I've kind of harped on about, the one with um, the effeminate actor who was in the movie version of Man About the House with Melvin Hayes as his boyfriend, uh, quoting that play was in, Ten Little... Uh, but he was correct. It, but probably, it was called that, and he probably that, he's been character, that's what it was called, but obviously... Afterwards, it was renamed Ten Little Indians. That's just one little line. You know what I mean? And the Jack Smedhurst with Nina Baden Semper um, episode, the one of future Frank Thornton and the man who plays the Verger in Dad's Army. There was two little throwaway lines, that's all. Um, obviously, to, the, these would not be quoted today in the current climate. You know, um, but if you just overlook that, it, the whole series is excellent. Um, and, I, and I think I will finish off with um, like um, what you should do about watching the show and then an overview. Uh, but what I'm going to do for now is I'm going to stitch these together. So I can keep abreast of what part is what part, and um, and then once they're all in one group, and I delete the separate segments, then I know where I am. <laughs>